Hello and welcome to another episode of the Project Purple Podcast. I'm Dino Varley, founder and CEO of Project Purple. Today we're back in the podcast studio. I've got another special guest. Special guests. I got husband and I assume husband and wife. Yes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, with us coming to us all the way from Little Rock, Arkansas, Theron and Latoya Slaughter. Thank you for joining us here on the Project Purple Podcast. Thank you for having us. Thank you. We- we I know we, it. we've had to reschedule and, and we'll get into that, I'm sure in terms of, uh, you know, original appointment, but, uh, mm-hmm. I'm excited to have you guys here. Um, I say this often, I, I know our staff reached out to you guys, I th- I believe via social media, we, we found, yes. uh, Theron's story and I take a, 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 a quick pause here because social media can be so negative, but I, I have to say that we have found so many wonderful families um, in the 13 years, almost 13 years, 12 years here at Project Purple through social media. And social media really has been a gift for us to connect with so many people battling pancreatic cancer throughout the world, not just here in the United States. Um, So I always try to put the positives versus the negatives um, and to connect with families and and to help share their journeys has been really something special. So we connected via social media um, and, uh, I, I'm just excited anytime we have survivors on the podcast, because what we do here at project purple is we're fighting for survivors. We're, we're pushing for better treatments for more early detection, um, so that the survivors continue to, uh, happen and we continue to see the percentages rise. So anytime that I can interview a survivor and their family. It just is, is really something special. And, and we've had a lot of people here on the podcast over four years now, but uh, I think it's it's really something really special and testament to our community and to the pancreatic cancer community. Anytime we can bring a survivor on who's going through it. And uh, I really appreciate you guys taking the time to talk to us today. So with You're that, welcome. You're so welcome. well, thank you. Um, as I said before we hit record, uh, this is where I'm going to hand off the mic uh, to Theron and Latoya to kind of share their journey with pancreatic cancer. And as I said, you guys can go as far back as you want. You can stay as high level as you want. And uh, with that, the microphone is yours. Okay. Uh, my name is Theron Slaughter, of course. Um, probably last March of last year, I started having symptoms of being tired and back aches. And so my wife is a registered nurse. She took an assignment in Texas and I went to Texas with her. And the whole time we were in Texas, I was tired the whole time. And so she started noticing me being tired because I'm a very active guy. And so we left Texas. We came home and what? May, yes, middle of May, end of May. And my symptoms started to get worse. I started having back pains and I started going to the chiropractor thinking it was my back. And I came home one day, we just nothing was working. And my wife looked at me and she said, sweetheart, you're Mm Janice. And so she was like, we need to go to the emergency room. Yeah, at that point, I knew this was not just back pain, you know, mm-hmm. yeah. And so we decided to go to the emergency room that night, and they kept me overnight, a uh, couple of days, actually. Mm-hmm. And they told us they would come back with the results. And, of course, they came back to, with the results that, what, two days later? Yeah. At first, they were saying, you know, pancreatitis, of course, and they did a biopsy. And um, after discharge, the doctor called us. And as you can imagine, that call was probably the worst day of our lives, like flipped our worlds completely upside down when they came back and said it was pancreatic cancer. Um, Yeah, just completely changed our entire lives as we knew it right at that moment. So we've been um, dealing with this for a a little over a year now. Um, and it, it's been a process of, um, it's been, it started, you know, like a grieving process almost, you know, we, we, you start with the denial. No, this can't be happening. You go to the anger, 
the, the bargaining, the depression, and we're at this point at the acceptance stage um, where we've accepted it. He is, um, you had mentioned earlier, survivor. He's a thriver is what I call him. He's living, he's decided to live uh, and thrive while he's in treatment. So that's where we are at this point. I've called myself a specimen for <laughs> the last, what, 10 years? Yes. <laughs> and so I continue to call myself a specimen. He's proven it, yeah, um, every day. You know, I have my days, I might have three good days and two bad days or three bad days and two good days, but um, I've learned that you have to fight. You have to be strong because it is so many things that you go through. I think my body has been affected from my head to my toes. And so it's just things that you go through that you, you, you would never imagine. And so it's been, it's been a journey and I'm, I'm going to continue to fight, you know, this, doing this journey. And we're grateful for, 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 uh, people like you and your organization, your Project Purple and uh, the Na National Pancreas Foundation, PanCan, all of those um, organizations that are getting the message out there because not a lot is known about this particular cancer and, and you know, the survival rates are grim, you know, um, to say the least, especially, you know, compared to other types of cancer. And so, yeah, we want to, he started sharing his story on uh, social media, reach somebody and inspire somebody who may be going through, like you said, going through the same thing um, to, to keep fighting, to keep pushing and to show, you know, to show that if he can do it, you know, they can do it as well. So. And I, my parents both uh, died from cancer. They, they were cancer survivors and they both end up dying from cancer. Um, I kind of went that during, I kind of had that journey with my mother. I was there with her majority of the time. I was there when she passed away. Uh, my father, I was there with him some as he battled cancer and he passed from cancer also. It's pretty powerful to hear you guys both speak. Um, about this journey. I want to back up a little bit and I got a couple questions here. I know, uh, Latoya, you said, and I, I think Theron backed it up. He was a specimen for 10 years. Mm -hmm. So, uh, maybe our audience has a question on that. When you say 10 years, Theron, was that, I know you said you worked out and you were active. So, um, were you dealing with other health issues prior yeah. to this? Yes. I was uh, diagnosed probably 15 years ago with um, congestive heart failure. And they told me that I probably wouldn't live a year. And I decided I was going to beat it. And, you know, I still live with it, but it doesn't affect me at all. He was able to do it. And it came from a, an undiagnosed uh, case of pneumonia. And you know, which which affected his heart, uh, and but no one would know that he had any heart issue or anything. He's very active, was able to do anything he wanted to do. Uh, you know, just you you would know it. Very you know, large man, very you know, stocky, and the doctors would even be surprised because on paper he looked one way, but in person he looked like just completely healthy and everybody was surprised at how well he did with it. So he, he's been saying forever that he, yeah, he's a specimen and <laughs> he can, he can do anything. So even with this, I'm starting to believe it because the way he has gone through treatment, chemo and, and now radiation and now back to chemo, like he, he, the way he has handled it has been amazing to watch. So your lifestyle had to change when you got that diagnosis. So, I mean, I guess this is a, maybe a question that just, I just came up to me. So you were probably eating, working out very, I mean, so you're eating, I mean, to have a con congestive heart 
issue. Like you get, you got to be very careful what you eat because <laughs> if you continue to eat a certain way, it, heart's not going to work, right? Yes. Um, you got to work out. You got to be very, very disciplined to do all these things. So I got to imagine, I mean, this is kind of the obvious, you're probably doing all these things and then you have this thing called pancreatic cancer kind of sneak up on you. Had to be somewhat of a surprise given the, and I see you guys are both shaking your heads here for our audience listening at home on our podcast, because typically, and this, this is kind of one of the things I want and where I'm going with this. I know you said like you had the back pain and fatigue, um, but then you turned yellow and that was really the sign. But like back pain, back pain and fatigue kind of go hand in hand with a lot. Right. Um, right. I mean, I, I get back pain all, all the time because uh, I sit a lot, you know, and, and so I see a chiropractor once a week because of that. And I'm sure our audience listening and watching, probably there's a lot of people that go to the chiropractor weekly because of lower back pain or, you know, back chronic back issues, I guess you would say. Um, so that's nothing outside of the norm. And given that you were so disciplined and diligent because of your heart issue, this had to be kind of a, a you know, kind of a, a big surprise. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Um, my life was devastated. I, I, I was devastated when they told me that, you know, I had cancer. Um, especially, oh, I'm sorry, but, but especially because even, even after the heart diagnosis and all that, he even stopped drinking and all of that. And, you know, quite often uh, they want to associate um uh, heavy drinkers as you know mm -hmm. with higher risk for pain or cancer things like that so he hadn't drank in like how many years like just 14, 14, years. 14 15 years so even that so it, it, all of those things combined like you said it was a shock because he was living so well before this and not drinking not doing any of those things and to hear that yeah yes i was i was at the track every day you know uh, five to ten miles a day that I was doing at the track. And so I was, I had slimmed down. I was about 220 pounds and it was a solid 220 pounds. Six and, feet tall, yeah. Yeah, six feet tall. Um, and so I was devastated um, when they told me this cause in my mind, I'm thinking, why me? We have folks out here that are, <laughs> Not living right. <laughs> Doing all kinds of stuff. <laughs> stealing, killing, and I end up with cancer. Yeah, that's how I looked at it. Yeah, I, 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 that's, I think, a very common thing. I mean, I guess I can speak, I speak from experience, and, and, and my dad went through this, right? And so uh, my dad, you know, never drank, never smoked, um, was a laborer. I mean, he labor. He was a laborer for 32 years, so he was on the job slinging bricks and 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 you know mortar and all that stuff, and in very good shape. And he got it. Uh, and and you know, I, I think that's a that's a very common exercise uh, as caregivers and as patients. I'm sure that go through that, right? Like you do all the things that you're supposed to do, yes. but then you still get it. Um, and and I guess I will go back to what you guys said, it's, it's part of that process, I think, you know, and, and you said something so very powerful, Latoya was, you know, at acceptance, um, you know, because I, I, I think that's something that I've seen with, with having, uh, a, a lot of survivors on the podcast is having acceptance is powerful because I think it gives people the ability to focus as uh, Theron said, you know, in terms of staying positive and keeping this thing going and thriving, as you said, right? And I think right. a, unless you don't have acceptance, then I don't know if you can thrive. I don't. I don't think so either. Mm -hmm. I would absolutely agree with that. Yeah. And you have to have, you have to have people supporting you, friends and family. You know, without that help, um, you know. I, it's just, it's, it's hard. It's hard because when you're first diagnosed, you think about it 24 seven. That's all that's on your mind. You go to sleep thinking about cancer and you wake up thinking about it. And until you accept it, once I accepted that I had cancer, then my process was easier to live. Then I can 
I can function every day. Mm -hmm. You know, I started back to just being normal, just get up in the morning, take a shower and hey, I get in the car and just go somewhere just to keep my mind from thinking about cancer, you know, go hang out with a friend or, or just an aunt or a relative, just somebody to talk positive and, you know, we didn't think about it that day. I got a question for you, Theron, on, on that subject here. And this is, I guess it's a loaded question. Can you think back to the day that that happened? I, and maybe we'll call it a tipping point where the, where your mindset and your attitude tipped to that. And, oh, yeah. and can you say why? Like, what, what was it that, like, I'm just curious to share that with our audience. Um, you know, what what was it that kind of tipped you there? My wife looked at my face and she said, you're carrying a heavy burden. And she said, you're going to have to pray and ask God to help you with this. And I said, okay. And I remember that night praying. And the next day she was like, you didn't pray, baby. <laughs> she said, no, you got to go in there and pray. <laughs> and so that night I got on my knees and I asked God, I said, I need your help. If without your help, I'm, I'm not going to make it. I'm not going to survive. The next day I woke up and she said, you look totally different out the face. Mm -hmm. That day I had accepted that I had cancer. And now I got to move on and I got to be strong. You know, I have three children. So I got to be strong, show them that I'm strong, that I can beat this thing. I can, I can make it. I have to clarify something though. I, as a spouse or a partner or whatever, you know, you know, you know, your partner, you know, your spouse. And I, I could, he, he was just so heavy. He was so heavy and it was just all day, every day. And I could tell it was so heavy and I just had to, I had to, I had to be like, baby, you're just going to have, you have to let it go. You're going to have to pray about it, let it go, you know, trust that it's in God's hands, trust that he has complete control and you're going to have to let it go and let him take it because you cannot live like this. You can't live, you know, like this, you may be alive, but you wouldn't be able to live like this. It was just constantly, it was all he would think about. It would be all that he, it was, you know, I could just, it was just like he was carrying a weight and I, I I just knew it and so something had to give or or he wouldn't be able to thrive you know what I'm saying he just wouldn't be able to and so when I told him that and he really thought about what I what all I said and and went and prayed about it and left it there and he has been completely different ever since so our faith is of utmost importance to us in helping us uh you know cope with this and live with this 100%. That's powerful. Um, has faith always been part of the family? Something that you guys did as a, you mentioned three kids, uh, so upbringing and always, whether it's Sunday or Saturday, going to chapel, church. Right. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Always. My dad is actually a, a preacher and a pastor and uh, I'm a musician at the church. And mm -hmm. yeah, so my, all my life, entire life, both of mm -hmm. us, our entire lives. That's awesome. I, I grew up in a in a very strong Roman Catholic uh, family, and I can't remember many Sundays not going to church, mm -hmm. all the way through uh, through college, uh, and with my family. And it was such a tradition uh, for us. Uh, it's just really, really special. But I always look back at that faith as a part of who I am, and, and I think the the one thing and. and I love talking about faith because I believe in God, uh, regardless of whatever you follow. I, I, you know, you have to believe and have faith in something. But I think it's just so important for when people go through this journey um, to have that kind of faith, whether whether it's Judaism, Christianity, Roman Catholicism, Islam, wh whatever you believe in. Um, I think it's very powerful, um, and and I've just have seen survivors that we've had on the podcast that uh, that have really thrived, as you said, LaToya, um, have had a very strong rooting in faith. 
Yes. Yes. You, you have to. I have read, um, we, we, of course, when you find out something like this, you, I, I, I'm one of those, I read everything. I want to research everything. I want to know everything. I read every, you know, I'm looking up, I'm Googling, I'm everything. And I came across a study where um, they follow some people who, you know, who, whose belief system, you know, had, you know, some type of belief system rooted in faith and those who weren't, and they were ill. Um, the people who had a, a faith-based a belief system, even if they were doing poorly, more poorly uh, health-wise, their outcome ended up better than those who may have been even healthier but had no faith-based system. So I, I just believe it works. If nothing else, it helps you deal, just deal with everyday life better. You know, if, if nothing else, it just gives you a different perspective. Yes. And, and that is something I think <laughs> I, I, I chuckle here where we are today in our society. I don't know when this episode will, will air, but clearly what we've seen over the last couple of weeks, you know, and, and how, and again, regardless of the faith, I, I'm not here to preach one religion over the other, but how important and how impactful in a positive way faith can be to so many people. And I think to your point here, you know, when you go through something as as traumatic as uh, pancreatic cancer for not only the patient but the entire family, how important you know faith can be to the family and also to the patient going through that. I got a question here. I want to back up a bit because um, I, I failed to ask. So treatment wise, we go back, you turn yellow, you get the diagnosis, and then you mentioned chemotherapy, radiation, and more chemo. So let's talk a little bit about what you guys have been doing um, and then where you guys are right now in terms of treatment. You want me to do that? Okay. Well, he started <laughs> He started with um, chemo. He did uh, the Fulfirinox eight rounds of that and we thought we were done with the hopes that because of um, his staging he was diagnosed thank god stage 1b which wow. was fairly early so we were very hopeful that we would do the eight rounds of chemo and be eligible for the whipple procedure however because of two things his um particular tumor is has been a little bit resistant it hasn't shrank as much as they had wanted. Um, and that was number one. And number two, it is a budding that um, hepatic portal artery right yep. there. It's just right next to it. And they don't want to run the risk of, you know, uh, of um, nicking that artery or not being able to get um, good margins around the tumor when they try to remove it because of its close proximity to that artery. So they didn't want to do surgery. So we did the eight rounds of chemo thinking surgery. That was a big disappointment. No surgery yet. Then they wanted to do more chemo. So they went to the Jim Czar of Rexane. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure you've heard, yeah, heard of that one. Did that for a while. That one was not as effective as the Fulfirinox. So again, we're thinking maybe we get done with this surgery, now surgery, you know, we're like now surgery no surgery, uh, still hadn't shrank enough. So now he just completed, what, 25, 26 treat radiation treatments just last week. Oh, wow. Um, so we're, we have a week off, two. two weeks off, and then he'll start back on full fear knocks again. Yeah. So we're, the, the CA-19 numbers are coming down but they just want to get it, you know, th get the tumor to shrink a little bit more. Before, before they we... go in for surgery. Right. Mm -hmm. And see, this is the advantage of having your personal nurse. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it, it takes a village, right? Uh, right. And, I, and I'll ask a couple of questions uh, to Latoya after about that. So right now you're in between radiation, and then going back to chemo, hopes of shrinking the tumor, um, and then hopefully eventually getting the Whipple surgery. And in terms of tolerating uh, the, the, I mean, for Florinox, I'm, I'm sure Latoya knows just from a medical background. I mean, that's like the the kitchen sink of chemos, right? And I'm sure maybe the doctor explained that to you. I know sometimes 
Some people fare very well on it. Other people have other issues on it. Um, how's, how's the treatment as a whole, I guess we'll say, how's that been going? I know there were some complications. You've had some pains and some issues recently, I know. Um, uh, but overall, how's, uh, how you've been kind of feeling there? Well, the first round of treatments, oh my God, it was rough. It affected everything on my body. I, it was days that I would lay there for three days in a row, just on the sofa. I would sleep there. I couldn't get up. I couldn't do anything. I, she basically force fed me. And I guess, what, probably four weeks into that, I started to realize I, I got to fight. I got to get up. I got to move around. So I started just getting up, started um, just moving around daily. And I realized that once I started doing that, I started to feel better. And so when we started the radiation, I continued to just live every day. You know, you have to live, you have to, you have to laugh. And I am a prankster, jokester. <laughs> I hide in a closet to scare her. <laughs> so I just went back to being me. Um, yeah. You know, I I might text my friends or call my friends at 3 a.m., you know, <laughs> just to, <laughs> you know, just I love it. a gangster. No, it, it was really rough. He had some of, the, um, some of the more common side effects, like the loss of appetite, the... The hair loss, obviously. <laughs> well, you didn't know him before, but this was not his before. But the loss of appetite, the hair loss, uh, the mouth sores, um, mm. you know, the thrush uh, on occasion. Um, I've lost of probably lot, yeah, weight 20, loss. Uh, I lost probably 75 to 80 pounds. Yeah. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. Nice. Radiation was a little better when mm. it was um, because it was mostly just fatigue, a little, you know, fatigue with radiation, not as many side effects. And so um, appetite came back. He's gained a little weight back, a little bit more energy. So we're not, we're not looking forward uh, to going back on the welfare knocks, but you know <laughs> you know, it is what it is. But yeah, this time we know what to expect. So uh, we'll know how to handle those side effects uh, better this time. But overall, I think he's done an excellent job compared to some other people we know. We have a very close friend who who was diagnosed around the same time. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, she passed um, about a month ago. And mm -hmm. but um, her her experience was vastly different from his on the same exact regimen, uh, just vastly different. I also had a nephew who was diagnosed mm -hmm. the same day that I was. But he was diagnosed with stage four, and he died probably two months two after months he was after. diagnosed. Wow. So I, I got to ask, and I'm sure the audience is probably thinking this as well, um, genetic testing. I mean, I know now genetic testing is, you know, across the board should happen uh, for mm -hmm. the patient, uh, for the tumor, and also for them, germline testing. And I know you mentioned before, Theron, that both parents passed from cancer, and now you mentioned your nephew had pancreatic cancer. So what was the, con anything come back on the genetic testing? Absolutely no. not. None, nothing. There were no, um, um, what is the word I'm thinking of? Um, so it, um, genes of significance, basically, right. or anything no that of, was. No, no mutations. That's what Mutations, that, correct. Yeah. No significant mutations, nothing, which I was quite surprised by as well, given his family history. But yeah. Not. yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I'm not a scientist. <laughs> I don't <laughs> pretend to be one. Um, but I gotta imagine, though, given the family history, um, and then the fact that you had a nephew, that's like really, you know, like usually when you start to see bloodlines like that, and you start mm -hmm. to see cases. I mean, I, I, I've been doing this 12 years now, and I have met a couple families that 
didn't have a genetic mutation that was identified that we knew about, but they have rampant pancreatic cancer in their family. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they they call these, um, like genes of, of, of insignificance or that, that they haven't identified yet. Right. Mm -hmm. So I, I would imagine that there might be someone out there that might want to take a deeper dive potentially, um, which we can certainly, uh, talk about that offline, but mm -hmm. it's just interesting, you know, having a strong family history of cancer and then genetic testing. I mean, that, I think that's like the one frustrating thing from a patient advocate is that, you know, we, this case, uh, in, in fact, like, you know, you have a strong family history of cancer, but, you know, genetic testing, which is, I guess, good and bad, right? Like it comes back, like there's no genetic mutation, but then it's also, but there's a lot of cancer. So why is that? Like, where right. can we find some answers? And I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir here, as they say, you know, right. I'm sure you guys would love to have more answers and more reasons why, um, but just kind of fascinating. So given that, I, I got to ask the question and I want to ask both you guys and out of respect, we'll go to Latoya first and then we'll go to Theron. How has that been mentally to process? You have a friend that gets diagnosed around the same time, passes away. Then you have a nephew um, who gets diagnosed and you guys are still in the fight. So has it been difficult to kind of process or how do you process that? So first we'll go to Latoya. It has not been difficult. And again, I it, it actually has made us so grateful um and actually i i feel like he's still here for a reason he's still here for a reason i feel like he's going to be here for a reason and again i'll go back to our faith playing a very large part in that but i do believe that he's here for a reason and that i do believe that he is going to make it through this and survive in order to help a lot of people i i honestly believe that um so, so dealing with that, the, 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 you know, the closeness of, of the friend and the nephew having the same diagnosis and taking very different paths have just made me feel like he's here for a reason and he has a purpose and, and that he's going to fulfill that purpose. I really believe that. So what about you? Um, let me back up one, one minute. I did not mention that my grandfather also died of cancer. My great grandfather died of cancer. Hmm. Uh, I was four years old when my great grandfather died of cancer. I was, I was there on his bedside when he took his last breath. And so, um, thinking about that, I am, I'm very grateful. You know, I've, I've, I put up a good fight, and I'm going to continue. I, I believe that I'm going to beat this. You know, it's, you can't tell me that, that, you know, I'm going to survive. That's truly what I believe in my heart and my mind. So, you know, I'm just going to live my life normal just every day. And so I'm going to continue to surround myself with people who have my best interests and who are positive. Are positive without I, now i truly believe had she not stepped in and said you're going to have to you're going to have to just live baby had she not done that and just i don't know if i would survive i i was so stressed and so heavy all i thought about was dying every day I'm dead. How long do I do? Is it a week? Is it a month? Is it six months? You know, now I never think about that. Um, I think about, you know, how long I've been fighting and I'm having a good run. You know, I'm, I'm doing pretty good compared to people that I know that I go to treatment with. And I look at some of these guys and you know, I, I kind of feel bad, you know, that they're not putting up that fight. I, I don't know if it's because they don't have faith or they don't have family around. I see people in there by themselves that are still working that have the disease. And I don't know how they're doing it, but apparently some are still working. I know I couldn't work every day, but like I said, I, I'm just enjoying, I'm at peace. 
I feel better than I've felt in years. It's powerful. How long have you guys been together? Ooh. We've been married 10 years this year. We've been together 15, maybe 15, I don't know. Yeah. Somewhere there. <laughs> 15, I think. Yeah. I, uh, Hearing Theron speak just now, I, 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 you know, I could see, you know, the, 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 the relationship, the bond, the strength, the love, um, and to hear him say that. So that's why I asked that question for our audience watching. Maybe they catch that same thing, and uh, it's pretty powerful. I, I, I think you know, we, we have a saying that no one fights alone, yeah, and right. no one should, no one should fight alone, and. Uh, you know, to have a uh, a loved one, and and clearly Latoya, you're an, you're an RN, so you kind of know what's going on. And I had a question for you here, but uh, on that before I get there, you guys have both mentioned family and friends and strength, and and I think again, no one fights alone, and and it's just so powerful when you see people have that strength and have a unit uh, yeah. to get them through that fight together. Is just so powerful, and I hope our audience saw that moment and sees that moment. Um, you know, because I, I, you're battling, you know, and and, and you, you, no one does this alone. And and I know as uh, I think people often take pride in like achieving things. Um, oh, they're right. right. Correct. But beating cancer is not something that you do alone and you shouldn't have, you know, you need a team, you need a team, yes. you need loved ones, spouse, kids, friends, family, you need that. And you got to be willing, I go back to what you said, acceptance, right? You got to be willing to accept the help. Um, and there's plenty of groups. You mentioned many of the groups in the beginning, right? That that have kind of helped other families through this. And so, you know, uh, I hope our audience listening at home got that because uh, it's just so powerful. Um my question here, Latoya, and I got a couple questions left here. Um, how's it been for you? You're an RN, you, you know this. Um, I, I don't know if you deal with oncology, but I, I think you know knowledge is power, which is sometimes a good thing and sometimes a bad thing. Um, so how has that been for you being in that field? This is in your space. Um, you know, Theron's going to the hospital. I'm sure many, plenty of times you've kind of questioned certain things, or maybe you've brought things to the table that weren't brought to front of the medical staff. I, I do, I do serve in that role here. I'm my nurse background is critical care. So I see you ER, all things critical care. I've, I've done it. Um, and, and so I consider it an advantage, um, being able to understand what's going on, being able to uh, relay those things, like serve as the liaison, so to speak, between him and the doctor. Sometimes, you know, I, I'm there to explain, and and I'm his advocate. I'm I'm his advocate 100. If if I feel that we're going in a direction that's you know different from something he said, I'm I'm going to fight for him. And fortunately, he has that because quite often. Um, and, and I've seen it, you know, I've seen it in the hospital with my patients and people that I've cared for. Um, if you don't have someone there fighting for you, and it's sad to say, but it's true, uh, sometimes you don't get, um, uh, you know, the treatment level is a little different. Mm -hmm. I'll put it like that. Do you, you understand what I'm saying? So, so. <laughs> Yeah, yeah you, if you, you see what I'm I, I I know, I know. I'll say it because uh, if you don't ask, you don't get right. And if you Absolutely. don't know, and I think the bigger thing here, and this is what you know, we hope that these podcast episodes do, is uh, if you don't know, you don't know, right? right? So people don't know what to ask. And I know we've talked a lot about advocating, and, and really, if the patient doesn't feel well or doesn't, you know, if you don't have, if you don't feel comfortable going into that then you just, you got to ask, right? And people right. have to be their biggest advocates. And it is helpful, you know, having someone in the system that knows how the system works. The system is good. It's not great. Right. We strive to be great. And so that's where we hope with these podcast episodes that, you know, we can help people, encourage them to ask the right questions, to continue to advocate, um, to continue to, you know, ask for things that maybe they never thought about that the hospital can offer, whether it's services or different treatments or additional treatments. But I think a lot of times patients go into it and they, they just don't know, you don't know what you don't know. Right. And Absolutely. so I, and, and 
the way our medical si- and we have a great medical system here in this country. I'm not trying to throw anyone under the bus here, but it's just the way the system is, right? It's just like yeah. they're not gonna they don't you don't come in and they don't give you like the a la carte menu and say, here are your choices in in terms of care. Check the box right. that you want. It's kind of like okay, you have this diagnosis. This is the treatment protocol. This is what we recommend. Okay, do you have any questions? Of course you don't, because you know you don't do it, right? But if you know, this is why it's so powerful sharing these journeys, because uh, the tips and tricks that people use in their journeys is so powerful for the next person going through it. Right. Yes. And I would love to, you know, when at at the end, towards the end of this, when when they um, we give our information, I would we we actually would love to be, you know. Um, points of contact for anybody who does have questions, if they're going through something similar, um, I can answer things from, you know, a medical standpoint that maybe they don't understand. Um, Farron can share his experience, you know, that's what we want to do. And and that's why we're here today. That's why he started sharing on social media, but it's been a, it's been a blessing that, that I've had, you know, the medical background that I have had in order to help him navigate it because it, it's a lot to navigate um, any type of major medical issue, but something this serious and something that it, it's a lot to navigate. So I'm, I'm grateful that I've been able to, to be here and know what's going on and help him. Yes. And, and, you know, it, it's been wonderful. It's awesome to hear. Um, my next question, and this is for both you guys, um, and this is a question that we get often here at Project Purple, um, and I love asking thrivers and survivors this question because I, I think it's an important one. You guys have mentioned family, your church, that have been really part of you know this experience in a positive way. The question that we get all the time is, my neighbor just got diagnosed or my cousin, relative, someone that they know um, has just been diagnosed what's the best thing that I can do for that person? And I always love asking survivors and family members this question because people don't know, I feel. And I think this is kind of taboo in a way almost because people think, well, I see people either go away. They don't, they don't reach out to their friend. Oh, the friend has pancreatic cancer. Oh, I know it's bad. I'm not going to reach out to them. Or they don't know, they don't know what to say. It, it, they, they don't know what to do. So they just go dark and they don't, they don't even reach out and say, Hey man, I'm here for you. Or what do you need? I'm here. Or they come over and all they want to do is talk about the cancer. (laughs) You know, they go kind of the other side and and I'm not saying they're doing that purposely. They maybe think that that's the way to help them. So the question to the both of you is what's the best thing that maybe if you guys want to look back at a personal experience that a friend or a family member or something that has just worked that that is really impactful and really powerful for you guys? Yes, I have friends and family that since I've been diagnosed, they don't really reach out to me. They don't really know what to say. And then I have friends that come over and they will ask me, how am I doing? And I will start telling them the side effects that I go through and they listen. And some of them are like, man, I, I would have never thought that it would affect you in this way. And, you know, so some of them are just, I, sometimes I need that ear just to, besides my wife, you know, I need that ear to talk to people and, tell them how I feel and how I hurt, the pain, the aches. And so you need that. And so I would say, if you have a neighbor that has told you that they, they're going through this, just kind of, you know, go by and check on them. Just let them know that you are here for them. Because, you know, I, I felt like people, some people abandoned me, you know. I feel like sometimes that, they're living their life. They're just going on without you. And so you, you kind of feel that way sometimes. You know, hey, it's going to be all right. Just continue to fight. And you're, you're going to make it. You know, just be strong. Latoya, would you add anything to that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, I would say the first thing that is the most helpful is to not feel sorry for them. 
That's that's one of the biggest things. We don't want pity. We don't want sympathy. Um, we want to be supported and uplifted and encouraged. Uh, you know, those are the biggest things you need at this point. Not pity. Um, you just need help. He had, you know, he mentioned the friends. You know, some some don't know what to say. I think they stay away maybe because they just probably don't know what to say, like you mentioned. Mm-hmm. But those who do are have been wonderful. They just he has a, a best friend who brings food just randomly. He'll just cook and just bring food, or he'll come by and put up a table if I need something put together, or, or put together some chairs or something, or or just come by and sit with him and just be like, you know, just talk about. Any, you know, just reminisce about good times, but it's not ever, uh, you know, like he doesn't ever come from a place of like pity that that's, that could be probably the worst thing you could do. So if I were to suggest anything, it would be, don't feel sorry for it. You don't need sympathy. You need encouragement and, 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 um, support and to be uplifted. You know, that's all I would say. Yes. Powerful. Second to last question, and then we're going to share uh, where our audience can connect. Um, and my last two questions are, there's no right or wrong to it. Um, they are somewhat, I call loaded questions. Um, maybe that's a bad term, but they're they're tough questions. Um, they're like thought provoking, I guess. Let's assume someone listening to this podcast just is walking out of the doctor's office and gets a very similar diagnosis to pancreatic cancer. Not necessarily one thing, but maybe it could be a handful of things. What would be your advice to that person? What are maybe some of the things they should do, shouldn't do, or maybe it's just one thing that like you would kind of give them advice to do? I can go first. The first thing is if, if they're, they have any faith, just pray. That's the first thing. But in the second thing I would suggest is to... Uh, research or, or reach out to any type of organization that can help direct them to uh, the best treatments, op- treatment options, the best physicians um, that has the best information that is clear and concise and that can help, you know, break it down because it, it, all of this stuff can be confusing. So just the first thing I would do, you know, re- reach out to, to something, do a little research, find the best physicians in your area or, or the best clinics, the best doctors, and the best resources and, and to get some support because you're going to need it. You're going to need all the support you can get. Um, I'm going to say you're going to go through that stage where you're going to be angry. You're going to feel sorry for yourself. You're going to, why me? Let's get past that quickly. Reach out to people. If you have a spouse, talk to her. Tell her exactly how you feel. Um, Because you're going to need someone to lift you up. You're going to need somebody to, you're going to need that supportive person. And once you get that, just start thinking about, I think about my future. I don't think about the past. You know, I, I, I reminisce and laugh about it. But I think about what's coming ahead, how um, we were in a, we were about to build a home when this happened. So all that was put on hold. And so I think about now, hey, we're gonna, uh, what we're gonna do, we're, we're gonna, once we beat this, we're gonna start building our home. You know, I'm gonna start doing this. I, I think about the future. I think about just, just uplifting thoughts. I don't think about woe is me, um, the the pain that I'm going through. And, you know, you just, if you continue to think that way, you're not going to make it. You're not going to survive. And so you have to be positive. And so you have to surround yourself with positive people. Powerful. My last question here. As I said before, the the previous one, this is another thought-provoking one. There's no right or wrong to this um, answer as well. But I'd love to hear both you guys um, define the term pancreatic cancer. What is pancreatic cancer? How do you define it? And uh, we'll start with LaToya. 
<laughs> oh, how do I find it? I define it as a as a um, it's a debilitating disease, but it's not. I wouldn't consider it terminal. I wouldn't. I would say it's it's something that um, can be overcome with a lot of prayer, a lot of support, a lot of faith, a lot of positivity. It, you know, it, it, it's some. It, it's something. It's hard. It's something that's hard for sure. It's not easy. It's not going to be easy, but it can be overcome. Theron, how do you define pancreatic cancer? I think of it or defined it as, first of all, scary. When, when you are told, it is, it is very scary and painful, very painful. But belief, have belief. If you have belief, you think that, you know, you hear all the stories of people dying from it, you know, but if you had a belief, you, you can beat it. And I think that I'm gonna beat it, you know? It's just plain and simple as that. I believe, me and her both <laughs> believe that I'm gonna beat it. You know, I love I love this woman. I, I don't see life without her. You know, my life is with her. And so, you know, that's I, you know, forever, you know? You know, we have, Tattoos. I, I never thought I would tattoo a woman's name on it. <laughs> uh, I love it. I love it. That was a hard uh, question. Though. I have to think about that. I'm going to think about that now that you posed it. I'm going to have to really think about that, what is. Yeah. That's always our last question, and it's always a very thought provoking one. Um, I, I want to thank you guys both for uh, for being guests on the podcast, for coming on the podcast and sharing your journey sharing your experience with our audience in an effort to help raise awareness and help other families going through it. And uh, before we get to, uh, to the end here where we, we uh, will we'll give your social media or wherever we want to connect people with, I do want to say this. So yeah, I've been taking notes and, and you see this often. Um, and, and, you know, there's an arc that you guys have been on right with this mm -hmm. with this journey but it even goes back to you know hearing theron talk about being on his bed for his great grandfather and, and when he passed away and that kind of hit me cuz uh i have a very similar experience when my grandfather passed away from colon cancer i was at the hospital and i remember i was i was a teenager i was late teens i was like going into college leaving high school and i remember my mom said hey you before you go to college you got to go say goodbye to your grandfather because we knew he wasn't going to last. But I just remember that moment. And then to hear you say that, you know, and, and I do believe, uh, as we've said, I believe in God, believe in faith. But I do believe that uh, sometimes the things that we go through, we don't necessarily know why we're going through them to prepare us for the future. And and to hear you talk about your parents, your gra grandfather, your grandfather, and to have all these experiences with cancer and then going through the heart issue you know, that, and then getting you to where you are now, like in going through this journey and your faith, Latoya and your friends, there's like an arc that you've been on, right? And I can look back as a, as a storyteller here of, of helping to tell your story that you've kind of been on this journey, on this path, uh, which is pretty special. So I, I want to thank you guys both for, um, you know, coming on the podcast and sharing your family history um, and, and sharing your journey uh, to inspire others. You've inspired me here just in the, the 55 minutes that we've been talking here. Wow. Um, it's been awesome to meet you guys. So um, with that, I, I want to give you guys an opportunity to connect with more people. As you said, um, Theron's been very positive on social media. And so where's the best place for someone listening or someone watching this uh, to connect with you guys? I would say um, our Instagram, his Instagram page is just his first and last name at Theron Slaughter, which is really easy. T-H-E-R-R-I-N-E Slaughter. Um, and mine is actually linked through his. So because mine is underscore simply slaughter, 
but that yeah, you can find mine here. Or he you can even email and his email is also just Theron Slaughter at gmail.com. Awesome. Pretty easy. Yeah. Latoya and Theron, as I was just bringing up your Instagram page here, make sure I'm following you guys. Okay. Uh, thank you guys for being a guest on the Project Purple Podcast. It's truly been an honor. And uh, you know, um, your story of thriving. And, and I wrote this down. Um, I can't wait to send you guys a Christmas card to that new home that you guys are going to be building at some point in the future. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and we can't wait to see it and thank receive you. it. Thank yes, you I, I've were... enjoyed just sitting here, getting to uh, talk to someone. You know, it is it gets a lot off your chest when you're able to just sit down and talk about what you're going through and how... You know, you from the beginning to now, it has just been it's been hard, but like I said, I wouldn't I wouldn't change it, you know. Thank you, Theron. Thank you, Latoya. Thank you. Thank you. That's a wrap of another episode of the Project Purple Podcast. If you like what you hear and what you viewed on our YouTube channel, feel free to follow us, share this episode, and until next time, please be safe. That's a wrap of another episode of the Project Purple Podcast.